Good morning, Mountain View Church. My name is Brandon Brickley. My nickname is Brick. Um, I'm on staff here. I'm the executive pastor. And uh, this morning, as we come off of our busy schedules and our busy summertime, it's finally starting to feel like fall. We had our fall kickoff, and it was like 99 degrees. So hopefully you guys are feeling fall is upon us and things are, are moving along. But we, we're in this, three, this series that's basically our, we wanted as a church to really, as we enter into this season and get into a new rhythm, uh, or back into a rhythm, uh, we wanted to uh, focus on on the things of, of who we are, what we're about, and what do we do as a church. And so the series is called The Way. And week one, Brandon talked about how the series is called The Way and not the MVC Way because our hope and our, our passion and our, our aim is that we make Jesus the target. That if, if, if we do anything as a church... That, that we make Jesus the thing that we're aiming for, and the way of Jesus is, is our goal. And so we, he, he talked about in week one about how if we do that, and if we allow him to be alive and active in our lives, we believe that, that God is doing something in our church, and the goal, the result of that, is that the community and Jesus' name is famous in all of our communities. And so um, that's our hope, is that people know Jesus uh, not just by word, but because we're living out active lives um, in Jesus Christ. Week two, we built on that foundation of, of Christ being our aim, and we put meat on the bones. And, and, the seri- and the title was, What If? What if we stopped focusing on the small things like our preferences and instead loved those sitting next to us? What if we uh, yielded ourselves for the sake of others and be unified, keeping the main thing the main thing in humility uh, and authenticity, building a foundation rooted in the, the biblical teachings of Jesus Christ and, and how when we live those things up, if we could figure that out, if we could live for one another, live for Christ first, but the, the great commandment of love, loving one another as ourselves, if we could do that in this place, in these walls, what that would look like in our communities, how, how amazing that would be if people really saw the church being the church in that way. And then this morning... Uh, we're going to unpack uh, how this truly is a call for MVC, uh, but it's a call for the Big C Church. And if you ever hear a preacher saying Big C Church, um, it's basically the universal church, so the broader community of churches, the people, the Christians in general. So the Big C identifies like an actual group. And it's a name about uh, the, the, the church that um, is, is Christianity. Um, and so it's a call not just for us as individuals, but ultimately, it's a corporate call for all believers. If week one was our aim is Christ, and that's our goal, week two was that God through us brings about the restoration of all things, Things. then week three this morning is we do it together. That we do this thing called church, we do it together. And, um, and the idea, it's a pretty broad statement, and, and many of you are like, okay, I, I get that this is a place that we gather, we're doing it together, we're in seats, we're in a group of people, obviously we do this thing um, together. And even, even if, if you're not familiar with church and what we do, this is something that's common, like, you just kind of assume that's, that, that something's happening in the church. The middle schoolers and the high schoolers her- heard me share this story on Wednesday. But I, I even knew that the church is more than just, I mean, we have a beautiful building, right? This is, this is pretty amazing. Um, but even, even without knowing what the church was and it was about, I kind of innately knew that it was more than just a building early on, or at least my brother did. I remember, I remember being like five or six years old. I, I didn't grow up in a, in a Christian uh, home, so to speak, or at least church attending homes, uh, home, uh, so to speak. But I remember uh, being around like five or six, and I remember passing a church which was about as close as I got to a church at the age of five or six. And I remember asking my, uh, my brother, because I noticed the architecture was different. There was a cross and it like, you know, steeple and all that. And I remember saying, um, what, what's that? And he goes, it's a church. And I said, well, what is a church? And he goes, oh, it's just where weird people do weird things. <laughs> and uh, little did he know that he was right, because we are kind of weird and we do weird stuff. But uh, even he, at that moment, at that early age, knew that it was, it was identified by a group of people that gathered together. And so it's kind of, it kind of goes without saying, but I wanted to just start with the fact that, like, we know that, that churches gather together, but what are they about? What, are they, what do they do? And every church professes what they're about, 
And there's a lot of things people say they're about, and, and um, they use all different means to communicate that. They use social media. Um, but Annie is such a blessing to this church. She's, she's able to use creative ways to, like, to advertise or, like, communicate and to uh, put that out into the community what we're about. Um, some people use social media. Some, some use, like, actual takeout uh, advertisements. And some people use billboards. I don't know if you, did anybody grow up in an area where the church billboard was like a thing? Yeah, so you guys know a little bit what I'm talking about. I didn't, but I, I've seen the memes. And so people have these church billboards. This is one that I found. We're all about that grace, about that grace, no devil, right? So this is, it's a dorky uh, meme or a church bulletin uh, billboard. And then this one caught my eye, tweet others as you would like to be tweeted. And I thought those were just funny, funny ways that people are like trying to advertise this is what we're about. We're about grace. And grace is an interesting thing. That's, and, and if you look at um, this, this idea of um, some churches even use it in their name to communicate what they're about. That word grace is the number one outside of denominations. So outside of like Baptist or Covenant or if, you have like a, if you're a part of a denomination, outside of those words, the most common word used in a church name is grace. But second is community. Community is something that, that, that almost every church will communicate because it's true that it's central to who we are. Like we are a, a group of believers, and by definition, there's com- a community of people in this, in this building. Right now, there's a commu- we have a community. This is a community. We're gathering together, and, and, and we're sharing certain things. A quick search of what is a church, uh, you see the idea of community, of community all throughout. And so I, I, I pulled up this list. This is, was just a, a quick search. The first thing that popped up, a share, shared beliefs and values. Members of a church often come together around shared religious beliefs and values, creating a sense of common purpose and identity, mutual support, like, a com- like any community, um, I wonder who wrote this, but or where AI got gathered all this information. Like any community, a church provides supports to its members through fellowship, pastoral care, and various forms of assistance. Social interaction. Churches frequently serve as social hubs where people connect, share experience, and build relationships with one another. Common activities. Churches organize events, worship services, and charitable events that foster a sense of belonging and collective effort. Sense of belonging. Being part of a church community can offer individuals a sense of belonging and a network of relationships that extends beyond mere attendance. So I read through this. This is like my my initial search here. And I thought, this is pretty good. Like, this is a pretty good, like, list of things that the church ought to be about. And and a common, that, that word community started to pop out. And, and you see it highlighted. I, I made another slide that just kind of shared that, that, that I illustrated this. Shared beliefs. That's important. A sense of common purpose and identity. Mutual support. Community. Fellowship. Social interaction. Social hubs. Connect. Foster a sense of belonging. Belonging. Being a part of a church community sense of belonging and network. So I read through these things and I was like, this is, this is great. In fact, all of these things are true. In fact, they're essential for us to navigate life. And these things ring true to us because this is how we're wired. These things, we are wired with an innate um, longing for connection. We're built for relationships. We see this all throughout scripture. In Genesis 1, it says this, God's, after God created everything, uh, it says this, that God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. Notice a couple things in this creation story. The very first thing that popped out to me was 
God says, let us make man in our image. He uses the word us, and there's, there's, it, it, there's, it's dense in theological under, undertones, and, and there's a lot of different thoughts on this, but, but the general consensus is that the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is at the nature of God's being. That God is, is relational by nature, by the very being of who he is, which is a hard thing for us to really like put our minds around, but that he made us in that same likeness. So that it says, let us make man in our image, relationally, part of like nature being in our, in our, in our bones, and let them have dominion. And the last thing that, that popped out, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. So we are created for relationships. And then in chapter 2, it, it goes even further. When they, they zoom in into the, the, the creation story, it says, when Lord, then the Lord God said, it is after he created man, before he created woman, it is not good that man should be alone. We were created relationally and for relationships. We were created in perfect union with God. And if you think about before the fall, I, I'd never really like sat with this, but it's been, I've been sitting with it this week, that we were created in perfect relationship with God, but that we were created perfect relationship with, the, with one another. And that like blew my mind, like picturing Adam and Eve and like no, no, just perfect unity, perfect intimacy. And that's how we were created. Relationships are embedded into the very core of our existence and it's not only the context in which we were created, it is that the core of our purpose. So fast forward today. We live, uh, we have an innate longing for connection. But we also live in a time that's increasingly focused on individualism. We're in, increasingly focused on, on Western biblical principles, which has brought so much to this world in way of personal responsibility accountability, autonomy, and those things are, are true, and the Bible speaks to how, how each person has unique value that we are created individually in the image of God. We see it all throughout Scripture where, where he calls you by name. This is another Scripture I just taught on on Wednesday where, where he doesn't just, just uh, see groups of people. He sees you as an individual. You see this when Zacchaeus, you know, the wee little man, the wee little man was he, climbed up to the sycamore tree, right? So he's trying to get a picture, a, a, a glimpse of God, and then God, and then Jesus is walking through the crowd, and Zacchaeus is up in this tree, and he points to him, and he says, Zacchaeus, he calls him by name. He says, come and we'll eat together. We see a story of a lost coin, the lost sheep all valuing as an individual. Even uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't say that for whatever group of people believe in him, it says whoever. And so the, the Western worldview, the, the, the shift that came through Jesus and through the scriptures is that we are individuals. It's the bedrock of our culture. But as the West is built upon this foundation, the focus on the individual has paved the way for a message of I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody. You know, that, that kind of thought like I'm an independent. I, I survive and I thrive on my own. There's whole like sections of psychology that are, are really like they, they kind of play into this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the, the word like codependent. And I remember the first time I ever heard this word, and it's about like, well, I'm not dependent on somebody else for, and you fill in the blank. And I, you know, I went growing up. I, w I remember hearing this for the first time at a, a family member's was in in recovery. An extended family member was in recovery, and I was at family group, and I heard about this codependency. Uh, this term codependency. And so my family for like two years, that was just like something we threw around. It's like, stop being so codependent. It's like, pass me the salt. No, no, you're codependent. And it's like this, like, I'm my individual. I don't need anybody. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting. And there's, there's, there's uh, utility in certain aspects. So, so I don't want to like throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's, there's certain unhealthy dependency that we have on one another. And there's a lot of good things that come out of that. But the, but the most recent neuroscience and the most recent fields of, of psychology, which uh, fascinate me, 
they, they point to, the, to, to realizing that we were created for connection. We were created for, for not dependence on one, other, one another, but like an interdependence. And so the more that we're uncovering and, and, and realizing about ourselves or, or, or secular, the more that the secular world tries to uh, come to grips with who we are and how we're wired, the more that we're, they're, they're finding biblical concepts to be true, such as we were built for relationships. And it's counter to our whole childhood. If you think about like, so you think about that in society, but then you think of that like as individuals, right? When a baby's born, um, they come out and, and it's like this shock, right? You, if you guys ever experienced this, it's like, what? You know, it's like, man, they come out and it's like, this world is crazy. And so even the first couple months, you're trying to mimic like the shush, shush, sway, shush, the seven S's, whatever they're, shush, sway, uh, side, suck, swaddle. What else do I got? I'm doing pretty good. Um, five S's. Um, you're trying to mimic being in the womb because because we're cre- we're created. We don't even the uh, and it's it's true that in the first like eight months, the baby doesn't even know that they're their own being, which is just fascinating. They still think that they're connected um, to their care their their caregiver, and so that's why when they they come out and they start discovering their hands. Have you ever seen a baby that discovers like, what is this? And they're looking at it and then they like hit themselves or scratch themselves or they like jolt. And it's like, because they're, they're discovering that they're different from, from their, their surroundings. So they start coming to this place where there's like an independence. And then the more, if you guys, you guys have seen this, I've, I've got three kids and I've seen this where over time they become more and more independent. I am my own person. I am, this is, this is, part of human development, human development um, and an attachment theory if you're into that. Um, and then they get to a place, like I have a, I have a six-year-old, and all my kids have been through this, where you're, it's, it's constantly, I can do this. I can do this by myself. And it starts out with like little, I remember the first time Paisley, it's like she's like th- three or four. That's my 12-year-old now. But, and I'm, she's, I'm going to tie her shoes, and she's like, I got it. And then the next like five minutes, she's like twisting and like trying to loop through. It's like, okay, let me help you. Okay. Um, and, and they don't really have it, but there's this desire to like have this independence. And I, I experienced it recently. Um, now my son's six. And so he's well into this, like, I got it. I can do it by myself. This last weekend we were um, at Doheny or two weekends ago, we were at Doheny uh, for, a, for a birthday party and we brought the f- a fishing pole. So it's just me and my son. And uh, I was like, all right, we're going to go fishing off the longboard. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold the, I'm going to like get the longboard. You can sit on the back and then we're going to troll. So we I like cast out the line and we're trolling and um, trolling is like with the speed. So the line's like 30 yards behind us. And I'm like, tell me if I'm going too fast or too slow. Okay. And then, and then I'm holding the thing and he goes, dad, I got it. Like I got the pole and I'm like. Uh, okay, like in my mind, I'm like, oh, I don't think you got it. So, but anyway, I was like, okay, you can have it. So I give him, I give him the pole because he's got it. And the way that the lure goes is that you got to kind of tend to the pole so that it dives down. And if it die, if it goes too high up, um, a bird will think that it's like the bird will see it, and a bird. Will, so sure enough, I'm paddling, and I look back just to see if Beckham's got it, and this bird <laughs> splashes down. And then it just darts up with my lure. And then I grab the pole and I like try to pull it out, but I like set the hook into the bird. And so now I'm fishing a bird that's like flying back and forth. And it's like going around and all the like, it was a crowded day at Doheny. So they're like, who's this kook out in the lineup that's catching birds? And I was like so embarrassed. And, I, and so then finally I was like, okay, like, uh, gosh darn it. And so like I reel it in. Anyway, it's not important, but I'm sure you guys are wondering about the bird. So I'll finish the story. Um, so the bird gets close and it's like one of those nasty, it's not a seagull or like a, not that seagulls are kind, but it's like trying to bite me. It's trying to kill me basically. And it's fending for its life. And then the line got wrapped around its wing so it couldn't fly. And I felt horrible. And my son's like, dad, is it going to die? And then I was like, it probably is son. Um, it's truth is sometimes better. And, and then, um, so then it's trying to bite me and I put my hat over its face so that it like, I don't know, I think I've seen that in some of the sh- like animal kingdom shows or animal planet. So like, oh, it's like blind them. And then it's poking through. And um, long story short, I got it 
around and then um, and then I was like, this thing's gonna die anyway. So I just, I cut the thing. I didn't know what to do. This is gonna kill me out there. So I cut the line. I got it away from its wing. And then, uh, and then anyway, it's, and, and so I just cut the line and I was like, I was just gonna pray for it. <laughs> and then it starts like going in the water and it's, and then I reiterated to my son that it's probably not gonna make it. And then, um, and then it goes and it flies. And then my lure drops and everything was great. So if, for the animal lovers out there, it was fine. Um, I went way too far into that story. Where was it? Where, where am I at? My point is, is that fear, <laughs> I didn't do that in the first service. Uh, my point is, is that like that feeling of I got it, like I have this, I can do this on my own, is something even when we can't, even when we're not designed to, it's something that's innate in us in our child development. But the same as I, also, I have a six-year-old, I also have a 10 and a 12 year old because I know there comes a time where things start to shift a little bit. You have that autonomy, but then all of a sudden you're looking around. My, my oldest daughter's just went into middle school and you're looking around and you're going, where do I fit? Where do I belong? Who are my people? And so we have this, this, this child, this development where we kind of go through this independence, but then we're stuck and we're going like, where, where is, where, where's my community? Because we long for connection. And the church, rightfully so, answers that question. It says, here we are. This is a place where you can belong. This is a place where you can be free, where, where, where you actually are a part of something bigger than yourselves. And we see it in group, but my fear is, is that groups of Christians have settled, that we've settled for this idea of community, and if we look at it, if we look at this list, we can go ahead and throw that back up on there, we look at it as box to be checked and not a spectrum to experience, and so we take these, these, these boxes and we go, man, shared beliefs, check, I'm pretty sure everybody believes what I believe, mutual support, yeah, I got prayer one time, long time, check, Social interactions, man, we got the chili cook-off and we're doing all these, like, check. And we can, we, can, we can check all of these things. A sense of belonging, I feel like I belonged. I belong, like, a sense of belonging. And so many of us who we experience church at this level, and it's no wonder that more and more people, this, the research shows that more and more people are finding deeper and more meaningful community outside the church than they're finding inside the church. People are, are finding c- community in things like sports teams, school, dog parks. It's like, man, those people know me. We have shared beliefs that our dogs are the cutest, whatever it is. I don't know. If you take, mem- if you take church and like any, anything that's like religious based, you can check these box with a lot of different communities. Political party. Man, I got a sense of belonging. Those are my people. And if the church stays as checks to be boxed and not spectrum to be experienced, we see something, then, then, then it's no wonder that we're not experiencing the fullness of what God's heart is for the church. But the truth is we see something so different and something so radical when we look at scriptures. And it's so good. And for a lot of us, it's so scary. We see in Acts, it says, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. The thing that pops out, they devoted themselves to, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They dug in together. Fellowship, breaking of bread. In 1 Corinthians, it uses the imagery of the body of Christ. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 12, it says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. From one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. 
For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And, and circle down to verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. It says that you are the body of Christ. So this imagery is so much more than this, this list of community that we check the boxes. It says that we are devoted to one another in the apostles' teachings, that we're devoted to the scriptures, that we're devoted to breaking bread, that we are one body. Paul refers to his fellow ministers and churches and as his brothers and sisters. And he does this over 119 times, brothers and sisters. And this isn't just in like a, hey, brother, you know, like I can't imagine Paul's like, hey, brother, kind of like it's just this thing that you say because that's who, who we are. When you read the scriptures, you hear Paul that's experienced true life and persecution and serving and a common goal and purpose. And he's saying, you are my brother. Like that's the, that's the picture that's painted throughout scriptures. And this is a, a, an, an interesting thing because the word family, I think, sometimes is, is thrown around churches. And a little bit of a disclaimer, um, man, I, like I struggle with it sometimes because I've seen the church operate so far from family. And so even as I speak right now and I say the church is a family, you may have been in churches and, and, and your reaction may be, yeah, that's, that's a cliche thing. But when we read scriptures, like I, and I tried actually really hard to like address this from a new and fresh way, but I can't avoid how, how bold and how clear the scriptures are that we are a church family, that we are to be brothers and sisters in Christ. In Matthew 12, Jesus even pulled, brings this up. It says, verse 26, while he was still speaking to the people, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him and stretching out his hand. Uh, but, but he replied to the man who told him that, that they were outside. He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciple, he said, here are my brothers. Here's my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. This isn't just a... a, a culty church cliche thing like we're, we're a family. It's the way that we've been designed. It's the way that this group, God's heart for this group is. This is the hope for you in church. We do a thing called Welcome Home Lunch. I don't know if you guys ever have been back to it, but it's kind of like our new members, our new uh, chance to get to know who what Mountain View is all about. And um, one thing we recently started doing is, is we give out a picture frame. And you get a, a picture frame, but that's empty. And, and most of the time, people get the picture frame, and they're like, why do I have an empty picture frame? This is, that's a weird gift to give. You could have put, like, I don't know, something, a logo or something in the inside. And the reason why is because our hope as, a, as, as a, the leadership team and the overseers and the, and the staff and, and, and the leaders in this church, our hope is, is that in whether you're new here and you're visiting or you just haven't gotten connected, that in six months, eight months, a year, that you're able to put somebody's, put a picture in there that represents church as family. That these are the, this is, this is family to me. These are people that represent something important and significant enough in my life. And I'm, I'm super grateful and blessed uh, that while my wife will never let me put this like on our mantle and our picture frame, like our, because she's savvy with design and just going to do that. Um, I'm blessed that whether it be in my garage, probably this would probably make it like in my garage somewhere, but um, that I could fill, I could fill this picture. I could fill a picture frame with people in this room that I could, and I'm going to try and not get emotional if I make eye contact with, with people, but I could fill it with people that, I've, that I could, when you look at that checkbox, I, I, I'm not just checking boxes, but I actually know what they believe. I could put Jody in there, who's a part of our, our teaching team, because we've wrestled with some deep theological questions about what we believe. And, and, and he's my brother and my sister. We've done things in life. 
I think about the the pagans and and people that are like our close friends. It's like we this this would be filled with pictures of our families because we've we've done vacations, we've been been together, we've gone through ups and downs, we've prayed together, we've read scriptures together, we've leaned on one another in time in in our children's lives. I think about the Swambergs who are now in a different state, but how many times that we've done community together and life together in a way where I, when I see them, I say, that's my, that's my mother and my father. They're, they're spiritual mothers and fathers to me. I think about the staff here. I think about the, you know, Marty and, and people that are important that, that just, and I'm going to leave plenty of you guys out in the, for the sake of time, but I think about like, even like houseboats, serving volunteers on houseboats. If you guys want to know this, the, the silver bullet to like finding community, it's serving because I think of houseboats and I think about like, uh, I think about Kevin and, and like Kevin didn't know anybody coming into the trip and, I, and I, he got kind of suckered into it. And by week three, they were calling him uncle. And I don't know why, but like he is like our, he's like our uncle. Um, but coming back from houseboats, like and going through all of these experiences together where, you know, catamarans are flying around and lightning's hitting and we're like tired and we're running out of coffee, whatever it might be, like these, these moments that we have, these experiences that we have together. And, and I look at Kevin and I go, that's my brother, right? That's my brother. That's, that's my brother. And I, and I see these things and, and, and that's the hope for us. And the reason why I can fill that picture, if we go back to that list, is because it's, ha- it's happened in my life on a spectrum. And, and I, could, I could look at those things and say, it's not just chilly. It's that, we, that we've done life together, that we've experienced stuff together. And so, so this is the hope for us. When we look at these things, we go, man, this is the hope. And you might be thinking, well, that's great for you, Brick, but I've been coming to Mountain View for a long time, and I can't fill that picture with anybody. Or maybe you are new with us, and you've gone to other churches, and you've, you've heard the word family thrown around, thrown around, and you're like, yeah, that's, yeah, I haven't experienced that with the church. And it's hard, and it's scary. Maybe you've been a part of churches where, where you haven't been treated like family because people are messed up. And people are people. Some of that's just the way that things are. But it's but you you carry this hurt and this resentment and this this wounding where it's like you come to a church like this and it's like yeah I'll come and I'll check the boxes but I'm not going there at all. And I don't know what it is for you or where you're at when I when I set this picture up. But the reality is is that so much of the time we go through life and we think we, we can just do it on our own. N.T. Wright says this, we've been so soaked in, in the individualism of what modern Western culture that we feel threatened by the idea of our primary identity being that of the family we belong to, especially when the family in question is so large, stretching across space and time. The church isn't simply a collection of isolated individuals, as following, uh, all following their own pathway of spiritual growth without much reference to one another. And the reality is that it's hard and it's scary, especially if you have church hurt, if, especially if you have some things that have gotten in the way of you being able to connect with people, especially when maybe you're at a church and the, the things that you need to connect aren't here. It can be super hard. But I want to end with a challenge and an invitation. The first week Brandon set up um, chairs, and he said that most, most likely you identify with one of these four chairs. And so the first chair, he said, this, this is people that, these are people that don't have a category for God. We call them the spiritual nuns, not because they wear black and white and they're in the, in the, in the choir, but because um, on, a, on a survey, if they're asked what religion, they would check none. So that's people that just don't know God, don't care about God, aren't really interested. And then there's kind of the like, the, the maybe know about it, but they're not really interested in, in, in God. They, maybe they have a higher power or they kind of um, don't really identify with Jesus Christ, but they're, they're kind of like the uninterested, like I'll go to church on, when somebody drags me there, Christmas, Easter, whatever it might be. And then the third chair that he painted the picture of was kind of the, the nominal Christian. So it's somebody that's, that's come, that, that like, um, and that may be like a derogatory word, but it's really a descriptive word of like, yeah, I'm a Christian. 
I, I believe that I have community, and maybe you could check all those boxes with church, but, but when I talk about family, it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite ready. I'm not quite there. Um, and, then, and then the fourth chair being um, those of you that, like, experience church um, as family. You you're experience the rich, richness of community, and you do uh, feel connected to God's body. Um, I have a challenge for uh, uh, an invitation for each one of you. If you're in chair one and two and you're in, in here this morning and you, you kind of came in and you would say, I'm not interested in God. My hope for you is that you know that God loves you and he sees you. He knows your past, present, and future. He knows where you've been, what you've done, and, and, and who you are in every sense of the word. And he invites you into relationship with him. He calls you by name. He says, he says your name and he says, come, I want a relationship with you. And my hope is, is that as this is a very personal invitation and the first step in fulfilling that longing that you know, that you have deep down inside, that longing for something to be connected to something bigger than yourself, my, my belief and my, what I know is that that is Jesus Christ, that you have a longing for Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life and he calls you into that relationship. So my hope is and my invitation is to accept that relationship with Jesus. And in that, you're saying yes to a relationship, but you're saying yes to a broad, bigger body of Christ, and I would say welcome home. You're not alone in this, and we can do it together. So that's the first two chairs. If you're in chair three, a quick disclaimer. Maybe you're, you're uninterested, and you kind of show up, and you check those boxes because that's just where you're at because you have church hurt. Or maybe that that's what you long for and what you desire, but you're just not ready for there. And this needs to be a place where you can just attend, where you can you can do that and have the freedom to just be. Um, you need to, this place to be home and rest. Feel free to just just do that and know that you're always welcome here. But if you're in that chair and maybe this morning you're like, I long for that. I don't want to stay here. I I long for a deeper community. Um, my challenge and my invitation for you is that you lean in, is that you dive in. Would you move from checking the boxes to actually diving in? And in doing that, two things that came, as I was praying and I was thinking, and, and, and I, I believe that two things were put on my heart. The first thing was assess expectations. Sometimes, especially when we have church hurt from, from family hurt or wounds, Sometimes we have this idea of what church family should be because that it's true and it's what the Bible paints. But we have this picture of what, what it might look like or how it's going to come to be. Um, and Bonhoeffer says this, says, The person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. But the person who loves those around them will create community. So my, my invitation for you is, it, it, uh, is, is to just love those around you. You know, the, my, my inclination is to create all these programs to say, you know, and, and when we sit in teaching team, our teaching team is like, well, what did you give them to do? <laughs> and I so badly want to say, sign up for this and, and meet here and do this. But at the end of the day, if we could start with loving one another, if we could start with the lobby being a place where we actually stop and listen to people, if we start with maybe, like, asking somebody to just go out to lunch, that's how I met my best friend, was we were two 19-year-olds or 20-some-odd-year-olds, that, that, and he, he asked me to go to lunch with him, and I was like, well, that's weird. Uh, you're asking me to lunch? And I said, yes. And then we're sitting there, and, and, and he's to this day my best friend. That's, you know, however many years ago, 20-some-odd years ago, because, because we just loved one another and created that community. And so, so um, look for those oper opportunities around you. And then the second thing is, is heal wounds. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe from early in childhood, there's, there's a way that you show up and you're in this room or you've been going to churches and you still just don't feel like you belong. Maybe there's, there's depression or anxiety. 
insecurities. Maybe there's the defense mechanisms where you're, you're just super talkative. You're the comedian. I'm not sure what it is, but, but a lot of the times we can be in a community and actually still not be known. And what, what God put on my heart to just maybe invite you to is, is to, to dig into some of those areas of your life that, that if you've been left, if maybe this is a common theme in your life from, from childhood into middle school and, adult, and the young adulthood, where you've never really felt like you've connected, maybe there's something that God wants to heal in you, a story or a defense that you've picked up along the way. And two things that I will, I will, I will provide for or offer to you is, is we'd love to pray for you. There's going to be prayer at the end of service on both sides. We would love to just pray over whatever those situations are. Um, and then inner healing. We have a restoration ministry here at Mountain View Church that is dead set on, on healing uh, past wounds, allowing Jesus to restore the stories of our lives so that we can show up in community and genuinely connect with people. What's broken through relationships, first first in a supernatural sense, gets restored through the power and doing of Jesus Christ. But the restoration of all things happens through relationships. I'm going to end with this, the last chair. And so those, those resources are available for you. I want to end with the last picture. Because some of you guys are like, I'm in here. I, I have community. I even have community outside of the church, but it's faith community. So I can, I can, I'm in that spectrum. I got it. Things are good. Thank God, I'm so glad that, 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 that you identify with that. Um, my, my invitation for you, um, and I'm going to show up an image um, that, is, that rocked my world when I first saw this as a youth pastor because it's so counter to what God's heart is for the church. And I saw this in a youth group, um, and it, I remember just seeing it and, and weeping because so many times this is, depicts the church. And it's this weird, this paradigm where it's like, we need to be the church. We need to love one another. We need to be family. And then we have this place where it's like, you know, cheers. Everybody knows each other's names. And, and we forget that there's people that don't have that. That there's people that are longing for connection and community. And so if, if you're in here this morning and, and, and you're that fourth chair and you have this for yourself, my invitation for you is to facilitate opportunities. Lead a group. We need, there's so many people, there's, if, I'm not going to do a ra ha raise of hands, but, um, raise of hands, but if, but if I asked how many of you want to be in a group, we would have more people that raise their hands than we have people to facilitate it. And so maybe it's leading a group. Maybe it's not even that involved. Maybe it's asking somebody to lunch afterwards. Maybe it's being a mentor and saying, hey, let's, after this lunch, do you want to meet regularly? I'd love to pour into you. I'm at this stage of my life where I'd love to just be a resource for you. I don't know what it is for you, but, but I see, and the cool thing is, and here's the, I'll, I'll end on kind of like a um, more positive note because I feel like I've done like a you should and we should, right? But I'm seeing this in community, and I have so much hope for this place in this, this congregation because I see it all over the place. I see people that love God, that are in community, that are doing these things. And I love the idea, I, I love that we have people that are like dead set on reaching back and sh shifting their face and pulling people in and saying, come be a part of this. I see, you know, Mark Brunson, in the, 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 uh, he was at the first service, but he's a part of our groups. He lives for groups. He lives so that people enter into this circle. You see the hospitality team and, and all the people that are out front and they're like, hey, we want to give you donuts. We want you to be a part. We want you to feel welcome. They're, they're saying, come, be a part of what we're doing. Um, but this is the hope and the prayer for Mountain View, and I love that we get to do this. So I'm going to pray uh, for each one of those groups, and the band's going to come up, and then we'll, we'll take a communion. But God, I am just so grateful. I am grateful that you have designed us, that you have created us, for community. God, each one of us have a longing in our hearts to be unified, to be connected, to be known, to be vulnerable, and to do life together. Lord, I pray for each person in here that that start and begin and, and, 
is complete in you, that we have a relationship with you that is the, the most important thing in this world, Lord, is that, that we know you and we love you. So I pray that be true for each person in this room. But Lord, you have also created us for community and in community. God, there's a lot of hurt in this room. There's a lot of frustration in this room. Because deep down inside, we need to be connected. Holy Spirit, I pray. I pray in this moment, but I take a step back and I pray for Mountain View Church. Lord, that the word family not be something that we hear and we go, but that it be something that is true for each person here this morning. And God, whatever it, whatever's needed for that to be true, whether it be a, a wounding be healed or, or a comfort zone to be stepped out of or a program to be created, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would make this place a space of family. And Lord, for those of us that have that, Lord, would you put on our hearts, Lord, a heart for others, that we would look for ways in which we could show up in the world, that we could show up in our communities, and that we could show up for people here on Sunday mornings to bring them in, whether that be a smile, a cup of coffee, a conversation, or a prayer. God, may this place be that place. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.